This is our Wednesday poetry reading, our 153rd Wednesday poetry reading, and we are lucky to have Alice Addy curating. It's our 912th New Social Environment, um, and the reading is titled Into the Reach of Language. And we're just so thrilled to welcome Alice, Maureen McLean, Gideon Khan, Naveen Kishore here today. So thank you all so much for being with us. Um, I'm going to introduce Maureen first. Um, so Maureen N. McLean is a poet, memoirist, critic, and educator. She has published eight books of poetry, including This Blue, which is a was a finalist for the National Book Award. She is also the author of an experimental hybrid of memoir and criticism, My Poets, which was a New York Times notable book and finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in Autobiography. Other works include two monographs on British romantic po poetics and numerous essays on romantic era and contemporary literature and culture. Her poems have been translated into Italian, French, Greek, Spanish, and Czech. She's a Henry James Professor of English and American Letters at New York University. Her latest book is What You Want, Poems, just out from uh, FSG and Penguin UK. Um, and be sure to check the chat as we will be having links to everyone's publications um, throughout. So thank you so much for joining us, Maureen. I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Hi all, I'm hoping you can hear me all reasonably well. And I'm thrilled to be here today and to join this incredible series of readings and also to have been invited by Brooklyn Rail and Alice Addy, um, whom I met a little over a decade ago at a writer's residency. So it's really an honor to be here. And I wanna thank Carolyn, Eleanor and Chloe for being our Brooklyn Rail shepherds. And it's um, a real delight to be reading with Gideon, Naveen, and Alice. Um, so I thought I'd read some poems from this most recent book, What You Want. And since we're heading into fall, I thought I'd read a poem called Equinox. And it, since we're just beyond the equinox and uh, the reservoir invoked here is the Central Park Reservoir in Manhattan. Um, if some of you are familiar with it. Equinox. Bees riddle the asters or are they daisies? Have you a thought or a pansy for me? The lenticels of cherry trees have cracked open to a deeper bark. Could your skin not open all along the seam of autumn? There's a gash in the mind, an old slipping into a reservoir. Yes, no, yes, no, frog splash. Along the bus route, a hinge of wings, Butterfly thorax of the breathing possible. Yes, no, yes, no. Bees riddle the asters. We have not yet killed off the monarch butterflies who on the farther flowers fold their wings. Oh, I am eager for you. What is an unstarred aster? What flying thing does not fly? What is an unmoved mover? When is the truth not a lie? How does the earth size the sun? When does the moon wink back? When is a kiss a kiss and when an attack? Um, Alice titled this uh, particular reading um, Into the Reach of Language. Um, so I was thinking about that when choosing poems and um, this book has a lot of creatures running around in it, not only humans. And so this question of uh, creaturely language shows up now and then. And this poem is called Eels. Lake eels, zebra mussels, threat of an algae bloom. May all threats pass and we not go further mad. May our bones discover a new flexibility, aqueous. I can feel my gills grow, my every cell doing something with the light, in the light, the partial light that only sometimes reaches me in the lake with the eels. Now we're going to move from a lake to the sea. <laughs> the next poem is stationed um, on the shore of uh, uh, Gloucester, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, 
it's lighthouses and, and thinking about um, thinking by the sea, swimming in the sea, who has died in the sea, what the sea brings us. Now is the cool of the day is the title. And that comes from uh, a song I first heard from the great American singer, um, Jean Ritchie, an old song called Now is the Cool of the Day. From here you used to see the sea, the gulls still palaver, the fishing boats still eke out what they can. At dusk, the eastern point light every five seconds flashes white. The dog bar light shines occulting red. The 10 pound island every six seconds blinks isoface red. These are their characteristics. So many beaches, reefs, and shoals named for woes, then woes effaced like your footprint just now in wet sand. You've only begun to learn the high tides and low, the two of each a day. By day, I mean also night. By night, I mean the soft blank I used to be too shy to go swimming in. There are drowning children, and one must try to save them. So she thought, one thinks, and died trying. The old ways of being a person have their hold on me, and I move in the wake of baleful ships and a very few gods. I want to find something to believe in, the young poet said, beautiful, vegan, and scowling. It's disgusting, this posthumous stance I adopt some days, and some days it's thrust upon me, unwanted vestiture. She's only as beautiful as ever, another poet aging splendidly with her delicate gold jewelry and avant clothes. She grew up three towns away from Donna Karen, who is still alive. Yes, I said to the student who wanted to analyze the fashion system in Swift. There's no end to beauty and shit. This next poem goes um, pretty deeply into the reach of language via translation. Uh, it takes wing from one of the fragments of the ancient Greek poet Sappho, the fragment, um, fragment 58, uh, which is a pretty recently assembled fragment. And, um, and it became a kind of uh, ground note for the book. The title of this poem is called Get What You Want. And um, in the course of that fragment, Sappho invokes the myth of Tithonus and Io, the goddess of the dawn. Um, he was mortal. She's a goddess. She asked Zeus to give her lover eternal life. Zeus is like, okay, but she made a crucial mistake. She forgot to ask that Tithonus be granted eternal youth. So Tithonus ages and ages and ages into eternity, shrivels and withers and becomes like this little crickety like thing. So it's a uh, sort of extraordinarily ironic um, uh, myth. <laughs> so get what you want. You who like undergraduates are always young. Go in for the liar. Do not neglect to put your hands in the air, say wah, and wave the long night endless. As for me, the dawn breaks upon my tender body turning stiff, my hair from black to white. I find myself changed in this light, my hips locked, an untwerkable ass. C'est la vie, que sera. And you, forever young in the club that makes night danceable, delicate animals holding me up in this air. Some live forever, girls. Not I, not you, but some goddesses and the ones they choose, even the one who forgot to ask for endless youth. Remember the fawn streaking across the lawn below a thundering sky? That's not me any longer. Though the lightning shows the way it was once done. The winds shifted, now north that once blew south. I see you there laughing, rolling together in rhythms my blood also feels, so they say. Remember how they sang, how the legend goes, you can't always get what you want. The immortal aging rockers 
who for so long defied what comes to all, their hearts straining against deathless ribs. And the, um, the next poem I'll read is called Channel. And um, it's a kento, it's a poem made out of other fragments, in this case, fragments of speech. And its epigraph is from a Scottish poet, W.S. Graham, a modernist 20th century poet who had a bunch of notes to self. And one of them was take down actual speech. Um, so this is a kento made out of overheard actual speech. Everything in this poem was overheard sometime in the summer and fall of 2018 when I was traveling a fair amount in the U.S. Um, and in Europe. Um, so another version of the reach of language and um, eavesdropping <laughs> um, channel. I'm going to tell you a story. The lane we're going down goes by another name, Groper's Lane. That's right. We're in the red light district. It must have seemed rather avant-garde. It does so even now. I see more and more people sleeping rough. Because I always stay in nice hotels, I love brain. I know where your head's at because mine's been there. It's very hard for a Japanese person to understand what will appeal to American readers. I eat dramatically less than I did three years ago. Where's that heading? The incinerator. Will you be here long? England is a bitch. Isn't he the one who found your country, discovered it? It was an experiment. How do they decide which one is the male and which one is the female? Please proceed to the transfer desk. What you fucking doing? We are flying through trauma clouds. Regardez, maman. It's low tide. Let's go collect something. I have a great crusted newt. I confess I'm nostalgic for the old days when there was the avant-garde and the establishment and you knew what side you were on. We may expect to see Paris on the right-hand side of the aircraft. I believe in something, but broken bones are stronger bones. They don't have human rights in Berlin. She simply can't talk to the young people of Lampedusa. Why don't you smile? Give me two minutes. Cinque stelle, cinque stelle. Someone could have died. It was the best possible outcome. Life is hard. Why do you have to make it harder? We are the adults. Can you erase our messages? Thank you. Thank you, Maureen, so much. That was really wonderful. Thank you. Our next reader is Gideon Khan. Gideon, Gideon Khan is a writer, blues musician, and educator. His writing, fantastical at heart, currently centers the liberation of childishness in grown-up worlds. Gideon hails from New York City, where he lives with his wife and baby boy. Thank you, Gideon, for being here. I'll turn it to you. Thank you. I'm very glad to be here. Uh, thumbs up if you can hear me all right. Okay, fantastic. Um, yeah, first of all, a big thank you. Um, and to our first reader, Maureen, thank you. Um, so I'm actually going to be reading an excerpt from a piece of fiction that I'm writing. Um, it is a little bit fragmented, so please bear with me. Um, and um, I will mention that it is inspired, at first it was inspired by a, a short story called The, the Ones Who Walk Away from Omelas by uh, Ursula Le Guin. <clears throat> He often walks in common time, but this day, the onset of his 78th year demands an irregular meter. He goes briskly in 5-4 for four minutes before turning inland at the minor erratic and greeting the hill in 4-4. He sings carelessly, remembering how in a past life he sang with friends and rarely dined alone and never on his birthday. He isn't saddened by this, his heart beats strong and he sings loudly. 
He toes a gleaming shell and smiles. He hobbles down slow, so when his weight gets the better of him, he falls cleanly on the rock. Then he warms his hands in his pockets and looks across the river at the hull of a half-sunk warship. The dangling guts of the old bridge wear the sunset like a coat. The earth is hard and wet. The wind blown from paradise teases what little hair he's got left. It's rare to be old these days. Perhaps that's why he could smile, unearthing a shell planted loosely in the soil, fed by a neon sky during a rare respite from rain. He picks it up and never touches it. Rather, he drapes a cloth's repeated gasket over and under it, turns it twice and binds it with twine. He returns to his apartment. His visitor awaits. Of the wind-up horse that winds itself, of the cube still a cube while shifting shapes, of the shadow lamp whose shadows move independent of their cutouts, of the train whose spinning wheels take it nowhere, of all the impossible relics, the visitor settles her curiosity on a pen. It's slim and silver, old and well-built, capped, clipped, discolored too, saturated by the oils from the hands of whoever loved it, dead skin fills its grooves. The pen, she says, tell me about the pen. Not much to say, he begins, showing himself right off, however obliquely, to be a storyteller with a voracious appetite for details and an extraordinary breadth of knowledge, a man for which nothing is tangential. It was my mother's. She was from a small settlement overseas, a farming village, sugar beets and corn. Mischievous woman, so quick of wit her elders scorned her, never spoke of a word of English, even after the war. She was a refugee. She left home at 12, fled pogroms, traveled east across the continent, and lived the rest of her life in secret. She was fierce, always fierce, but with me, she was kind, she was soft, she was playful. For all her trauma, she always kept a bit of magic in her pockets, a bit of dust up her sleeve. That's how we survived, like a trick. She would tell people she was from nowhere, but in secret, she knew the history of her people to a T. She kept her roots, but she hated the idea of them, of roots, of borders and boundaries, alien citizens, strangers and families and community too. In her own way, she fought against these all her life. She would tell me stories in secret, stories of ancient beings, beings from the before time. He looks up slowly at the pen. She hardly wrote, though sometimes she'd do the crossword with whatever came to mind. Or rather, she wouldn't read the clues, but she made up her own. She always carried that pen with her until the day she died. What kind of stories did she tell? Asks the visitor. By purple fields that lit the slopes at night, snug and low lullaby hills at the mouth of a great river, the great city was born and died. At its height, it challenged the stars. Its marble so polished, its glass so pure, its geometry impeccable, impossible sounds and colors were made possible. It was in its day the only wonder of the world and people came from all over the earth to see it. Woven by canals, warped by souks, wefted by houses, and finished with stately facades that spiraled with interlaced pathways, the city was, if nothing else, a feat of engineering. Weekly parades celebrated its grandeur. Gold and blue ribbons streamed from the sky. Floats of entertainers, of politicians, of influencers glided by, heaving fistfuls of toys and medicines and gold coins below, smiling gaily as boys, as boys and girls flung themselves on their knees in ecstasy. Before dawn, whom they thought to be shadows, cleaned the streets and restocked the shelves, so like magic, they'd awaken to a gleaming city. For millennia, the city blossomed. Its citizens were happy, truly happy, and shadows were in no uncertain terms the condition of the people's happiness. One in particular, let's call her X, one of the ancient three, and one fateful day under clear skies, she left the shadows and went to war with her siblings. X, who in the before time had played with time and space, light and shadow, had her power sucked from her as milk from an unwilling mother. And on that fateful day she walked away, the entire city fell. 
A glass wind rose up and cut through stone and bone alike, and the people particulated before the stones did. At first quarreling, then yelling turned to shrieking, spitting turned to hair pulling, then eye gouging. They would have killed each other had the wind not failed them first. But X walked away, and I believe this story wholly. I believe that on this land, in this very city, her powers are still strewn, and that, call it crazy, the mystery of all these oddities you see around you can be traced to her. A grasshopper hits the pavement with an uncomfortable thud and trembles the slender flowers. <clears throat> Let me say that one more time. A grasshopper hits the pavement with an uncomfortable thud and trembles the slender flowers. One butter yellow petal jo joins its curling pastel cousins. Up the road, ants make work of the last bits of a corpse that seems awfully busy for a dead thing. A rust brown, once green fence post, long freed of any wiry connection, slowly leans, falling into oblivion on its own time, untouched by the human mind. A silhouette of heavy laden travelers, one small, one big, is cast upon the horizon as one loafing beast, but of course they don't see it or themselves that way, nor do they see the dogs behind them, tails chopping up the quiet dark. When a dwelling comes into view, it's built like the land itself, and the land is like a home. But to call it a home is not quite right. It's hard to say whether it's crafted by hand or grown organically, nor can one tell if there's habitable space inside, nor where the hills begin and the walls end. So they stand at the precipice gawking at where the canopy becomes the roof. The light is the same, but they look to the shadows. The shadows are the same, but they look to the light. The height is the same, but they see depth. The depth is the same, but something invisible towers up to the heavens. Time seems of essence now that the place is right. And while grown-ups scurry to find a door, the child looks, sees, and walks slowly. And while grown-ups know the child is astray and they move only to steer them, they grow tired and forgetful. They grow dreary and dreamy. Only then do they notice their shadows don't match the angle of the sun. Their swaying doesn't match the wind. Their crunch doesn't match the step. Their names don't summon the object. Only then do they feel that the time is now, that the kids are right, and more than that, that their certainty needs no justification, and more than that, that their justifications make no sense, their words being such weak substitutes for things. The beauty of the storms is their concomitance. Worlds collide, seeing red as the thunder cracks, lightning splitting trees as the heart breaks, feeling stranded as floods flash. The water and the rock steady the girl, this visitor, not where they're going, but what they're in, not future, but present. It's the sheets of rain that cleanse her and help her forget. It's the age of the glacial erratic that helps her find comfort in her smallness. Millions of years of uncaring, uncared for, unminding. The rolling waters of the river too disregard her. A buzzing bug, a hunted fish. She could die in its embrace and it wouldn't pay her any mind. It's a striking amalgam. The uncaring river, its gray rocky shores, the wind-blown facade and glistening wrinkles, the ruinous landscape, its shattered brick bones and blown out lawns, a motel sign reading vacant above a space that could only be so described and in a way the author never intended. And miles down river, a lifetime away, the fearsome, loathsome city where civilization is taking its last breath, clinging by force to what property it can, what people it can, what resources it can, what water and food it can. Her dreams of late unsettle her. She's used to falling, to being trapped on high. Height is an old friend of a nightmare. And it's not falling she fears, it's jumping. For fear lives in her muscles. She fears the urge to jump will win. She fears death will say no to life and life will skip a beat. Her fear is inconsolable. The monster is at once knocking at the door and locked deep within. 
It's under the floorboards. It's in the basement. It's in her bones. She falls. She jumps. She's thrown. She clings to railings, to facades, to strings, to beams, to ledges and edges. Whatever has but one way down. And sometimes it's not so bad, really. And sometimes it is. But when Rem hits, thank God, she accepts the whispers of the night. The next day, she doesn't recall how it felt. Now, in this dream, this particular one, like a bird, no, like two birds, they dart over the fallen city. What gives chase? She can feel the distance shrink. She can sense vulgarity of its form, however opaquely, spidery fingers and pointed nails, flowing fur unsheathing the shadows beneath, mouths with no eyes flying over the hollow folk, the once were, the fallen, the no longer human. But that's not quite right either. The shadows of her dreams are unfocused, torn apart like the families, like her family, once, twice, now three times. She wants to swoop to get a better look, but she moves slow as molasses, and soon she loses control of dreaming. It's music that finally wakes her, like a single note breathed into a horn and held aloft, draped over, alone over trembling percussion, one note unchanging. Others come and go, the bass line runs, the keys comp, and as they go about their busy lives, that lonely note dies away, disappearing into the tumult, into nothing. It comfortably dies. And if death is perceptible, it's only as a stable emotive force still being felt around it, imprinted on glass, on vinyl, like this very harmony screaming from the 78 shifting from major to minor. This is how she looks when from the window in her apartment, she sees her comrades return, her lips curling just enough to forsake her stony face. Thank you. Thank you, Gideon. Wow, that was great. Thank you so much. Um, our next reader is Naveen Kishore. Naveen Kishore is a lighting designer, photographer, poet, and publisher. He founded Seagull Books in 1982. Thank you, Naveen, for joining us. I'll turn it to you. Thank you so much uh, for having me here. Carolyn, Brooklyn, Alice, it's wonderful. Um, magic of technology. Can you hear me? Am I reasonably clear? Good. Wonderful. Uh, I have a not too many poems to read, but they're all unpublished. I thought I would choose from my daily practice because I write every day, regardless of what the day shapes up, regardless of whether it's two lines or 20. And the first one I is about a subject. In fact, I wrote an entire book about it called Knotted Grief, which is a very troubled part of our country called Kashmir. This is our, to give you a context, this is our Palestine in a certain way, or, or Syria, or you know, any troubled thing. Uh, so the first one is a poem that's not in the book, but got written much later. In orchards, once home, to fresh green apples, young men walk barefoot on rolls of barbed wire, their feet a testimony to an enforced puberty. Somewhere between what was the Oberoi Palace Hotel in Kashmir and the Iron Gate at the foot of Shankracharya. She sits and paints her feet red, leaving a bewildered horizon bleeding. It is the time of evening when the light is forgetful, a time for the sky to lament. The exiled ravens from a land under siege are watchful as a procession of familiar shrouds walks past. The walk to the lake is full of spiders busy shedding their skins. The procession of unfamiliar shrouds loses its way in the rain, crushing the spiders underfoot. The homegrown fog makes it harder 
to avoid the minds that failed to explode in a war that was no war. A convoy of trucks naked and without headlights enter the pitch black room. At the edge, for there is always an edge to all conversation, is the smell of freshly dug graves. Um, I grew up in a very sort of cosmopolitan environment in Calcutta in the 70s, well, 60s, 70s. Um, and just about every community, we were surrounded by Armenians. I was, in fact, married for a while to one from Calcutta, uh, Chinese, Anglo-Indians, uh, Jewish friends. I mean, it was a wonderful time, which has all changed. And uh, I had a neighbor, a very dear friend called Gregory, and I was obsessed with his mother at age 10, 11, 12, 13 as a school going. And um, the memory kind of remained uh, dormant for decades. And uh, then suddenly, uh, very recently, while researching the street itself, uh, it triggered a spate of poems on this woman Mrs. Clements, um, who was very interesting for a young lad because the house was full of growing up kids and older, you know, and a husband and her and a son and daughter who completely ignored her, except when she talked of migrating to Australia. And that's when she became animated. And otherwise, she just went about her work in this very strange, quiet manner. Uh, with a constant cigarette, which was more ash than it. So I'll just read two of the poems. And there's this whole series I've suddenly found myself obsessed with her. She sat with a glass of gin between her legs each night, except on Sundays. Her perfume had sung in a jazz band. It had learned to improvise and swirl, wrap itself around her tight satin legs seek refuge in armpits that smelt of last night's dream or Australia. The rim of the glass hummed a whistle at odds with the red nails. Her feet, busy arguing amongst themselves, refused to take her home. The ash of her cigarette was always precarious. One other small one. Uh, this is also for Somebody is no longer here, Amri Baraka. She woke up the night, climbed out of the grave, sat on the tombstone at the edge of her bed, reached for the empty bottle of gin. I asked her if she hadn't had enough. She peered at the gaping mouth of the empty, her tongue licking staleness. Have you heard the crickets at the Park Street Cemetery, she asked. Dead people and live people should not mix. One more, a last one, uh, which is from a possible sequence called Naked Like Breath. Do you know the feeling, she asked, to which he answered with a question. What feeling do you mean? The one wherein your heart or the region where it is known to reside tends to pull, tug a little, like a sensation akin to something being squeezed or a slight gnawing caused by fingers pinching a piece of flesh. That kind of feeling. Do you know it? She asked. And before I could answer, she reached over, unbuttoned my shirt and twisted a bit of the flesh between her fingers, hard and fast, and she was done. While I winced in sharp pain, amazed at the swiftness 
with which she had lent expression to her question in terms made physical by setting into motion an action that would simulate the feeling she had begun her question with. And before I could recover sufficiently, she had already buttoned my shirt and moved away in a manner that hinted that she had already lost all memory of what had just ensued between us. Or perhaps, I think too much in any case, she appeared well. The word that best describe it is lost. She looked not quite there. Yes, lost. He rubbed the flesh which had turned reddish and risen like the bread that his mother boasted as the best in the world. Strange that he should think of his mother or the bread she baked with such facility and confidence, even as she squeezed and pinched the dough and mixed it to perfection while trying to soothe the pinched skin, set as if ablaze by the touch of a stranger and a woman at that. And in a place such as this, I mean, who would imagine that in a party like this, with over 500 people vying for attention and drowning themselves in cocktails that appeared as fast as they disappeared into greedy hands of men and women who seemed to stare at each other, but only over shoulders of their companions, and that too, in a glance made stone by its lack of ability to blink, somewhat like a faraway gaze that had found itself in the middle of a forest completely abandoned and lost and didn't know how to get home or even what that meant the word home but the sensation in its chest if a gaze can be said to have a body part was one of pain the kind that tends to make its presence felt by tugging pulling squeezing pinching twisting like flesh imprisoned, however fleetingly, by two passing fingers that grab hold of it and perform the act of causing that nagging pain before moving on, lost in its old thoughts, as if to suggest that I had imagined all of this and that perhaps it was I who was lost. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Naveen, so much. Thank you for that reading. Gosh, I feel like everybody, yeah, could read longer. It's just so wonderful to hear everyone. Um, so our final reader today is Alice Addy, a visual artist and poet. Alice Addy received an MFA in poetry under the tutelage of June Jordan and completed a PhD in comparative literature. Addy's writing addresses the challenge within the meeting place of language and the unspeakable how we accommodate loss, how we speak about what is inaccessible to language. The tenuous distinction between writing and drawing has always been a fascination for Addy. Alice Addy's visual work has been shown in many collections, including the Whitney Museum of American Art, the Museum of Modern Art, the Jewish Museum, the Getty, and the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. Addy's two previous books of poems, These Figures Lining the Hills and Under the Aleppo Sun, were published by Siegel Books. Thank you, Addy. So, Alice, for, so, for being here today, I'll turn it to you. Well, greetings, everybody. Um, uh, above all, thank you to the Brooklyn Rail. It's a, it's a wonderful privilege uh, to be a part of this community and to bring these readers, Maureen, Gideon, and Naveen, three fantastic writers, uh, to your audience. So I'm going to read um, mostly from my new book, um, Bending into the Light, but also a few a few poems from those previous volumes that you mentioned. Can everybody hear me? Yeah? The first one was a sayer. He said all things that came to him, all things that the mind could, all things that the mouth could, all things. The second was a saver. She saved all things to keep all things tiny, all things grand, she saved and kept all things. The third one was a looker, all things he gazed upon, all things he considered, all things he held up to the light to turn and turn and look upon. The fourth one was an able. She was unsure in all things she wavered, in all things her mind traveled back, her mind traveled forth, in all things she was uncertain. The fifth one was a counter, 
He counted the days, he counted steps taken, he counted things heaped in piles, counted all things in view, he counted them. The sixth one was outside. From all things she stood outside towards all things she swerved, from all things was distant from the center, from the sides, from all things she stood afar. The seventh one repeated. All things he heard, he repeated. All things he read, he read again. All things he turned to pass again and again. The eighth one was in the middle of, always in the middle of the stirring. She was in the middle of the crowd. She was in the middle of a commotion, in the middle of all, surrounded. The ninth one wrote it down. He heard and wrote down what he heard. He dreamt and wrote what he, he dreamt and wrote what he dreamt. He wrote down all things known and all things imagined. The tenth one was an embellisher. She heard the voices, the stories, she expanded them. She thought and her thoughts grew. She adorned all things, all things she enhanced. There is a poem in the heavy hang of the clouds, in the tree bark, in the child tumbling, in the reader reading. There's a poem in the calculation of a distant galaxy, in the years of light distancing, in the lamp's arc, in desire desiring. There's a poem in the note diminishing, in last looks, in the song, in the unseen. There's a poem in the man walking, and the woman shuffling, in the conflux of voices, in the saxophone sounding. There's a poem in the train approaching, in longing, in mourning, in the sky dimming. There's a poem in the heart's red fire. April, 2020. Come, dear one, come. Steady the undone doings. Steady the divisions divided. Steady the branch visible. Come, dear one, come be close. Be near from far. As time in increments of time suspends, come. Wander with me, come listen to the rain, its radiance, its rhythm tapping the mind as the chirp of a bird, I thought I heard, I thought I heard, will be something for us, ineffable. As the hawk circling, as we walk the long loop in the long afternoon, the frogs in small clusters dropping their croaks into silence, leaning into the reeds, their gold tones and chords, heaving us into thought, come, come dear one, be close, be near from far. Be steady as the tree is steady as the bird seeing your eye seeing is a mystery tumbling through us, measuring the hours, the days, the years as we are, as we were, as we will be in time present, in silence present, here and here and here is tumbling through us. Steady the stranger knocking at the door, steady the voice breaking up breaking down, steady the oak whose branches swing, whose leaves flutter, come, steady us as word to page, come into the reach of language, come into the moment, come as the sun against the cloud just barely in slow season comes, just barely as darkness into daylight comes, come be near from far. Iceland. I write letters to friends, and as I write, I take note. A small bird passes the window. There are figures on the horizon. They are lining up and laying down. To June, I write, but the birds and the bird man and the bird lady and the colossal birds so calm and still. I remember when you recalled the pigeon you came upon while walking down Bleecker Street, how he, she seemed so old. An old pigeon was a strange, and fascinating sight, disheveled and awkward. And so too were those wondrous morning doves nesting on the air conditioner. Sometimes the truth lodged there is too beautiful or too painful to contemplate. The wind has been high pitched and fierce, screaming its pure tones through the otherwise quiet landscape. I am moved by it, by everything. In the middle of the night, the sun still hovers over the sea and I take myself for a walk. The feeling of being immensely present, a sense of the enormity of place, the definitiveness of it, its strong, clear beauty. But for the urge to draw, to make something analogous to the mood, I would wander still further. 
Perhaps I'd feel safer in my wanderings than I've ever felt before, safe in my surrender to the landscape, safe in the weathering, safe in the light. I take books, I pile them on the table. I open one, I find a sentence and I linger. Proust, he said suddenly I stood still, unable to move, as happens when something appears that requires not only your eyes to take it in, but involves a deeper kind of perception, one that takes possession of your whole body. My mind drifts. I think about Henry James. I could read all the James novels I've ever read, or I could learn to draw the figure. It happens when I'm falling asleep, an idea comes, an image, one that I hope to recall when I awake in the morning, but it never comes back. And I rummage through the rest to find substitutes. I approach him, a man in the weight of his thought. I see him dim in the darkness pending. He is a man I have composed in the likeness of another. We are two under a dimpled sky. It halos oak and sycamore. It feathers the tufted hills. And the river is as brisk as the landscape it mirrors. We can slip down and wade our bellies to the sky. We can arrange ourselves in a distance we cannot reach to be as fleeting as clouds are, white against the gray. It's as if to name our common oblivion is to know that sea and sky and grass are one. It's as if something brushed against the leg, as if we could touch the pathos we lean into, as if not to have heard a bird's call nor seen the flutter of a wing is to heave insect and animal into the woods of the imagination or to see a man lug his way through the tall greens with his feet stepping high into the perch of his possibility is to become the gaze that fixes him and feel the heavy labor of his movement as he circles, as he measures two shadows as they lift into the arc of one. Into the crooked world, the crooked mind wanders. A young man is reading on a bench under a tree. The crooked tree is leaning into him, leaning into his story. And bells are ringing the hour. It is midday, the purple air is pulsing. The branches are chipped, revealing patterns, peeling and swirls to be drawn in and out of clarity and confusion. The bells chime in certainty and all around is a vying for attention. Inching my way forward, I throw my glance. I catch something, the infinitesimal. There is nothing to speak of, but the chimes or the details we cannot see or clouds blowing across buildings, the colors to consider blues and grays, transfiguring the sky, sequencing everything, tree, cloud, young man reading, water towers to count, to note, sequencing because not to think of them is to be inside them, because everything everywhere is vying for attention, because this is all and this is nothing, it just is. And in a far land, the bombs are falling, and the violin is like a cry, and when silence comes, you hear it still, and if you move closer, you hear hearts throbbing. And if you step back, the slow cloud grows red. There are things, this one a toy, this one a namesake, a photograph, an old woman weeping, a young woman weeping. They fill the world with weeping. Something into something disappears and the violin is like a cry and the dark day is darkening. And if you were by my side, we would hear them. Their strained arias. If you were near me, we would hear their long laments into forever. We would hear them falling. All night, all night I heard the breath of darkness. All night the unknowing of speech. All night strange birds howling. All night memories, all night their fierce orbits wobbling, all night groaning, all night overtaking, all night migrating, all night heaving odds into evens, all night 
into the night, the light all night, everywhere turning to you all night. Unutterable, unending. My undone self is unfurling, unburdened, unguarded, and unnameable, unfollowing the undulant unpaths to the unsayable. My undoing is uninked, its meaning ungloved. In ungenerous times, the unthinking is unseen. It unveils the unfettered to unhear, to unhear the unheard, the unopposed, the hour unsounding into itself is unfolding. Unmasked, unvoiced, unread, and unwritten, our uncommon unselves are unimagined. Unbending into the unbidden is the unsaid, unthinking, and unending. Thank you. Incredible. Alice, thank you so, so much. Thank you all deeply um, for this reading today. Um, it's just, yeah, been really, really luminous. Um, so just thank you all again. Um, this has been recorded and will be up on our archive and YouTube channel um, shortly. Um, and do join us uh, tomorrow on our um, NSC. You can check a chat, check the chat for a link to uh, register for that event. And join us this Saturday, October 7th from 6 to 9 p.m. to celebrate the opening of Singing in Unison Part 8 Between Waves um, at Industry City in Sunset Park in Brooklyn. The show is curated by Alice Nianpu Ko. Um, and we will also be celebrating the Rails 23rd anniversary and the launch of our October issue, which has just been released. So check that out. And um, yeah, as is Rail tradition, I will let you all unmute and you can say hello and goodbye. Right. Thank you. Thank you so Thank you much. much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you, everyone. Amazing. Oh, Thank so you so much. Thank you. So great. <laughs> Enjoy Have the rest of your day, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you.